for it. <laughs> there we have it. All right, now we can get started. Um, so we are Manderley Collective, a group of artists um, striving to kind of uplift one another and extend the primarily kind of individual endeavor of writing into a space of community and collaboration. Um, our mission is to use art as a force against isolation. We kind of arose in this, this moment of quarantine in, um, towards the beginning as a way to to keep in as we made our way and continue to make our way um, through this pandemic. Um, and so we're a force of isolation against that, but also working to be a force of isolation, against, a force against structural and, and socio-political isolation more broadly as well. And so um, in that vein, we are really excited to welcome here tonight, um, Abdul Samada Haidari, who will be reading his work, along with Jin Jin Shu, who will be facilitating and hosting the evening for us tonight. Um, so I'm going to introduce Jin Jin, um, and then Jin Jin will, will introduce Abdul here shortly. So Jin Jin is a writer and filmmaker from Shanghai. Her work can be found in The Margins, The Common, Berlin's Harun Faroki Institute, and NYC's Immigrant Artist Biennial. She is the 2020 winner of the Poetry Society of America's George Bogan Memorial Prize. Congratulations. And a finalist for the Cecil Henley Memorial Award as well. A previous Thomas J. Watson Fellow, she is currently an MFA candidate in poetry at NYU where she received the Lillian Vernon Fellowship and teaches ballet and poetry workshops. Very multi-talented art engine. Her chat book, There is Still Singing in the Afterlife, won the inaugural Own Voices chat book prize, selected by Aria Aber. Again, congratulations. Um, and it's forthcoming in November 2020 from Radix Media. So keep your eyes filled for that one in the very soon um, coming months. Um, so I am now going to hand the reins over to Jin Jin. Thank you so much for being here with us. And and sharing tonight and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much Marissa. Thank you to the Manderley Collective. We're really a force of joy during these times, all the events that they've put together since quarantine began. Um, I'll just begin introducing Abdul, um, who we're so lucky to have with us today. And thank you all for being here. I recognize a lot of your names and I just feel so held by all of you. So I met Abdul in Bogor, a suburb outside of Indonesia's capital, Jakarta, in May of 2018. It was near the end of my year of traveling, speaking to and writing with migrant communities across nine countries as a Watson Fellow. Like most encounters that year, we had met by chance, and yet it also felt inevitable. A gender studies university student I met in Jakarta had taken me to Bogor to meet Kausum, a Hazara woman who started a women's initiative at her, for her refugee community in her own home. It was a holy month of Ramadan. The Azan echoed across the city, calling everyone to prayer. The days were hot, listless, and the refugee community in Bogor slept only to wake at nightfall. They slept during the day because of the heat, of fasting, of fatigue, of depression, so they can be awake for as little as possible. They slept so they can have one meal a day to save money, so they can have less time to be conscious and to worry. They slept to escape. I stayed with Kalsum for a few days, which is how I met Abdul, who at the time was teaching English to women from the community in a makeshift classroom in Kalsum's home. When I began that year of traveling, I had been inspired by the plight of migrant working mothers in China to visit migrant mothers around the world. I wanted to understand the role of poetry and documenting their experiences, how to interrogate our role as witnesses, as daughters, as a role and potential poetry in situations of dislocation. Unexpectedly, as I traveled, I was pulled into many communities of asylum seekers, first in Berlin, then in Turkey, and one community led me to the next, leading me on their trail across false and fluid borders, across violent oceans and continents. Throughout the year, I stumbled and felt depressed and helpless about poetry, about words, about language and journalism and documentation, all of which fell to ashes as I witnessed and heard about terrors I do not bear to repeat or speak out loud. Poetry felt insignificant and useless. I could no longer stomach this language. And then I met Abdul, who told me in Kalsum's makeshift classroom, how writing was the only thing that sustained him during these long nights of separation, during his long desperate wait to be resettled. And here I want to give some context on the asylum situation in Indonesia. 
So similar to many countries in Southeast Asia, asylum seekers do not come to Indonesia intending to stay. They come here to escape their homelands with the hopes of being resettled to a third country that would give them rights. But they find themselves stuck here in indefinite transit, their lives put on hold without the right to movement, to work, or to education. So currently, refugees in Indonesia have no rights to freedom of movement and must stay in either detention centers or designated community accommodation. And in December 2017, the UNHCR told asylum seekers in Indonesia that the wait time for resettlement is going to be 20 or 25 years. This announcement provides no alternatives for these refugees no right, um, who have no rights to movement and employment and education. So there's no legal route to employment. They have to rely on money sent abroad by relatives. So this announcement essentially forces asylum seekers to return to the persecution that they escaped from rather than to wait for resettlement here. This sudden announcement shattered tens of thousands of hopes and lives, and even greater despair prevailed over the already hopeless communities and many suicides followed. A Hazara man who had lived in Indonesia for the past six years and now speaks fluent Bahasa Indonesian tells me that he has become familiar with the Indonesian funeral process. He knows how to ship a body back to this home country. The horrors and long days in Indonesia, however, is only a fraction of Abdul's story. There is too much of his story to do justice to here, so I'll let his poetry and himself speak. Abdul's poems published here in his debut collection, The Red Ribbon, which I carried with me to it, from uh, New York to Macau, is a desperate cry to be heard. It's a lot of these poems are intimately addressed to a you. He is placing his trust in the reader, us, to hear him. Language in these poems seems to shatter, become a primal scream, and to quote even Boland, our favorite person, these poems recreate the moment when poetry itself is called into question, when language is tested almost beyond its limits, when a vocabulary comes to the edges of the poem, which the poem can hardly bear. We're so honored to have Abdul Samad with us today, the first time he's speaking to an American international audience. Abdul is an Afghan uh, journalist, human humanitarian aid worker and a poet. He was born in 1989 and fled with his family to Pakistan and then Iran. He was deported many times and worked as a child laborer on construction sites. In, 2017, uh, in 20, 2007, he returned to Afghanistan to work as a journalist and cover stories about the Taliban's war crimes and terrorism. During this time, many of his journalism colleagues and close family members were disappeared. In 2014, he escaped to Pakistan and then to Indonesia, where he has been waiting for resettlement ever since. Abdul Samad has authored a book of poetry called The Red Ribbon, which is the top 10 bestsellers in Indonesia, I believe the top three right now. Abdul was invited to Ubud Writers Readers Festival in 2019, and I'm so honored to introduce him, who he is the one who restored and continue to revitalize my faith in poetry every day. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to, I wish to extend my heart and greetings to you, Jinjin, and a uh, very dear friend, Rachel, and uh, all the audience who, uh, who, who showed the willingness to join us today. And uh, it's a privilege to be here and share some of my poems with you. And uh, I would like to start reciting uh, a poem from the Red Ribbon. Uh, that poem also uh, the, the, the title of the Red Ribbon is taken from that, uh, uh, from that poem, which is called the Red Ribbon. Uh, this poem is uh, an attribute to my little sister, Hakina, who has been shot during the Taliban period. When the Taliban came uh, during 1995 and 1996, when they reached our village and the war began there, and we have been under embargo and uh, surrounded by the Taliban, and uh, the war started, and uh, I lost my little sister, Hakima, who was very young, six years old, to seven or eight, I don't exactly remember. So the Red Ribbon, uh, when she was uh, shot, and uh, all I could do was to take uh, a red ribbon. I untied the red ribbon from her hair, and then I took that as a memorabilia of a stolen life. Uh, so therefore, the red ribbon comes from that, uh, uh, that story and that incident. All right, <clears throat> it's called the red ribbon. 
I did not le leave home by twice. I escaped from carnage and I stayed a day in the eye, refusing to die. I fled from the bullets to stay alive. I did not leave home by twice. I escaped fear of death without even packing, but with a backpack filled with shots of broken memories lodged deep in my mind that haunts me every night. All I remember is scrambling in tears around the dead body of my little sister, trying to wake her up, but she would not open her eyes. So I took Hakina's red ribbon with me instead. I untied it from her hair as she was laying there, stripped in her own blood seeping out of a bullet hole in her chest. I saw her face was swollen, bruised like a red flower bed. I tried to wake Baba too, Baba means father, Baba too, but like Hakima, he let lifeless beneath the rubble. I tried to dig him out, but I could not save him. I desperately called for help, for help, but like me, others were too running for the lives of screaming over the dead bodies of the loved ones. My goodbyes to them would be for Ava, and that had to be a quick one, and me, couldn't even cover the bodies in shrouds of white, nor could I snap her out of her trance as she bowed loudly tears from her eyes in deep grief. I could not even hack the fallen walls of my home for just one last time. And me screams, watch out, as bullets flew all around us. I held her hand tight and we ran. And me with one shoe on, one shoe left behind, panting heavily as if our hearts were about to blast apart. And me is hit by a bullet, cries and screams, attempts to run on, falls down, left, I left her up, and she falls down again, trying to keep the wound closed by putting her fingers inside it. I too was crying, tittering in the embrace of life and death, fighting on with whatever was left. I struggled to keep her hands in mine as we tripped over rubble, dead bodies ripped by thorns on the edges of sharp rocks. Everyone was searching around for safety, but we kept running, escaping over corpses, corpses laying in the cold on roadsides and farms. All we could do was to run as fast as possible but this time it was only the two of us. We sought the hillside, hillsides for protection to shield ourselves as the bullets flashed like thunder strikes. I ran with Ami, we ran until we could no longer run. I cried with her, we cried until we could no longer cry. We fought, we fought together to stay alive. So I took Hakina's red ribbon with me in a state. I untied it from her hair as she was laying there, stiffed in her own blood, sipped out of a bullet hole in her chest. This time, it was for Ava, and I could not say even a goodbye to her for at least one last time. Thank you. I would like to recite a poem called The Red Ribbon, and that Red Ribbon defines the Red Ribbon book itself. So this poem is to define the Red Ribbon of uh, how I felt, how difficult it was during the time when I was writing the Red Ribbon, the book, and uh, with the kidney infections, with the all diseases and PTSD, depression, and uh, panic attacks that I was going through. And uh, at the same time, financially, I was so weak, and uh, it was a very tough time for me. I was laying, I remember I was sick and laying in the bed for almost two weeks and there was no one beside me. And, and it was a very difficult time. I could not go to even hospital during that time. So that red ribbon, this red ribbon is a definition of the red ribbon book. The red ribbon is not only a collection of poems, but a part of me. These are not just words, but beats of my being. Every word is a teardrop 
of mouth fell to mourn. They spelled out of solitude, despair, and helplessness when the heart could no longer endure. When I ran out of tears, a gory blood welled out. It raced down with so much pain as if someone was pulling thorns out of my, my lungs. My soul collapsed in the process, like shards of my home's bombed walls. And I burnt in its flames from top to toe, like my missile to a wooden door. I reborrowed a one more sigh to fist back my ashes so that I could stitch them back in place to form a poem. The red ribbons are crying, a cry for mercy and compassion. It is a plea to unveil your sights so you can see the babies swallowed by starving seas, youthful eyes openly buried beneath the layers of snow flocks. Bony mothers perished under the heavy feet of colonial guards, hungry for cash and human flesh. In the third poem I, I am going to recite is called Water. And this poem is uh, describing the life when I was eight years old or nine years old, and we were wandering in the desert towards Iran, I with my, my, with my father and a few other refugees. And we were walking, we walked on the desert, in the desert for almost you know, 13 days. Our feet were you know, parched with a lot of you know, scars uh, in our feet. And, uh, uh, I, I, I remember a few babies uh, died in the journey because it was extremely hard and we had to walk for so long. It was extremely, uh, it was a very difficult time. And I saw when I walked towards the border, there was wire fence, uh, uh, barbed wire, wire fences. And only I could see broken pieces of uh, clothes hanging on them as a sign that refugees have escaped under the wire barbed wire fences and only a piece of the clothes were hanging across the, those wires. So this poem defines the border, the cruelty that happens across the border, the, 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 the inhuman treatment and the suffering that refugees are going through across the border. Yet we always claim to be knowing and we always keep our eyes shut on what is going across the border, which always remains unreported, which has always uh, covered and you know like a mysterious thing as if nothing has ever uh, happened ever at all. It's called border. The helpless, the end of life, the beginning of death. The sands must have shrouded enormous souls, a welcome stopping place, always in red and black. It is an actual place the lodging act of a thousand cries, a murderous spot, tormed hundreds of dreaming heads. It stands in hundreds of rhymes of soaring sobs, gulped in, stuck in lungs. Drops of pleading tears drowned in the palms of flambeon sands, deep sinking walls exiled in solitude. In thousands of stanzas of volcano of chaos, glimpsed in this unforgiving desert, where bony children are bent down with the begging mouths, is still wide open. What else do you expect from a helpless, from a place scattered with bones of children? It is the end of life, where you long to buy mercy, but only smugglers sell it. It is a land with no sky, no God. Uh, the third poem I'm going to recite, the fourth poem perhaps, I'm going to recite is called Kalidras. Kalidras uh, is a place where 
hundreds, a few hundreds of refugees or a hundred, around hundred of hundreds of refugees are now uh, residing there in Jakarta, in the heart of Jakarta. And they, there is a big shelter, a big compound left, uh, an abandoned compound where refugees are taking shelter uh, recently. And once when I, once I went there, and I went there several times, but I wrote several poems, and this, this poem has been written the first, uh, the first time I visited that place. And I saw people in a very desperate condition, and it really, it was very difficult for me to, to see that situation, and also, you know, the desperate condition of children, women, and uh, in this hard, very hard, you know, flamboyant kind of place, uh, sitting there, laying there across the footpath without any food, without any water, without any shelter, and little kids, you know, I mean, little kids, even if, if we blame that others are leaving the countries, well, they have, should uh, they should have stayed in their home countries. We don't care whether they have, been, they, 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 they have died or whatever happened to them. But, you know, the kids are very innocent. And I think as human beings, everybody, you know, we cannot keep our eyes you know, shut. We cannot die with our eyes seeing this kind of situation. Little kids were playing and, you know, screaming with a lot of scars on their body parts, being beaten by mosquitoes and rashes all over the body bodies with lack of sanitation so i put I, I wrote this poem and uh, this poem itself explains uh, what i have seen and what is going on in calibus it's called calibus a poem in segments it is late in the evening i am sitting on the pavement in front of the popular broken tent chatting with a refugee family from Ghazni, afghanistan i draw aside and right. My thoughts. All my thoughts solidify, become whole, reasoned, steeped in, soaked, observed by the family's desperate condition. Feelings clash together, thoughts twisting into stormy thunder. I swallow hard to hold in, hidden, to mask a growing sense of empathy that will spin me out of control. The noise of projects and cars in the road distract me. Orangoran Kulang Kirja pass by with shiny shoes, blue masks covering their faces. They, they later look almost like sergeants on the streets hunting for land. Sergeants just out of their operating theaters, wearing fragile moods hanging in inquisitive eyes. The refugee homes pavement. Now the crowded pavements and pavement drones with distressed refugees, dust covered faces look like bed raggled war torn returnees, lips parched and cracked as Afghanistan's bombed desert. The eyes are round sunken like the tops of arid deserted wells, staring back at me through broken headlights on cars abandoned long ago. The children. Ghazni refugee children persistently ask for ice creams they see in the hands of local students returning home from school in blue uniforms. The father. The father is anxiously rubbing his hands together. His eyes are floating, barely open, defying gravity, aggrieved. Those eyes are contemplating the distance of the passing crowd hopelessly wondering if anyone would feel the lengthened strength night. I'm sorry. The mother. The mother is also there, silently looking at her husband. She does not utter a word, just stares at the husband. She once knew, well, he's now left aside, left cast aside, with eyes young, with, with his young Afghani pride, trumpeted, priceless treasure laying under the feet of bronze. The family, the mighty sky is closing its eyes for today. The darkness is almost there. Them with nothing to eat, them with everything to fear, them with breath breathing dust from shuffling shoes and exhausted humans, broadside. 
anger does not burden them like trauma and disappointment do. Will they turn its back on them again or stalk them this night? Will Afghani blood grant the ground or flow across the sticks? Fat heads pop out from the windows once in a while, but hands are not extended from the tall, from the tall buildings, not even those in colored uniforms. These people are left alone under the heat of colonial guards who eat children and abandon their remaining family pieces in the dark fist of the empty night. December 12, 2018. Uh, the next poem uh, I'm going to recite is about, uh, uh, about myself and uh, the, the, the trauma and depression and also the very difficult time and challenges that I'm going through right now. And I have been going, going through this kind of situation since 2015 and 16, with the panic attack and, you know, very terrorizing nightmares and stuff. Uh, I just uh, wrote this poem, how exhausted I am and uh, how dark I, 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 I feel and think. And I have been, uh, I have been harming myself uh, so many times and I have done that because of all the things going on in, in my mind. It's called, <clears throat> I'm sinking in this black hole there is no sense of a new beginning, nor an, an, nor an end. I'm desperately wondering, but all directions appear to be the same, veiled by stormy darkness, observed, clouded by fat fog. I can't figure things out. All I see is a long curvy road. I hate not seeing around the corners what is coming headlong towards me. They tiptoe me to be patient as I drift along, to swim in the dirge of hollowness, solitude. I can't bear leaving the carnage in my head. Tired of seeing girls dreaming heads blown, to read storm, to read autumns, rolling like an injured football, with the dreams residing when the bond leaps. I'm tired of distracting, fooling myself, so I don't stay alone fighting back the civil war inside my head. The civil wars that drag me down and make me feel like I am suffocating. There's no way to breathe except to slit my throat so air can rush into my, into my throat, into my veins. I'm sinking in this dark hole silently as time ticks by. I am drained, drowning. Help me out. Give me a hand. Unchain my feet. I want to be free. I want to fly like a fearful bird. This life is not, is not, not, not mine. Give me back my own being. Aries, these tattoos off me. I even forgot to know who I am. Show me a way out. Heart is bitterly tied, twisted with rage. My being is confined in the rings of political cage. Where is the way out? Point with a finger at this. March 29, 2016. This is uh, another poem. It is almost similar to that, but I am just, uh, you know, tied up tired of being confined, not being allowed to work, not to being enjoying my basic human rights, not to be to be able to see my family members. I haven't seen them for seven years now. And uh, I desperately uh, long for freedom. And I just want to be free as I am given uh, that right by God. That's my natural right of existence. And that has been taken away from me. And I just plead for that right now. It's called Set me, set me free. Freedom seems so beautiful, but I'm not free. I'm not even allowed to fantasize it. I have the independent will to fly, but the weight of chains pulls me down. If I could breach these chains of my feet, the shackles of my neck, under the back-to-back pens 
I would run away, away far from this darkness, despair, and solitude. I would disappear, disappear from the scary cage which they call, which they call my home. I want to breathe the fresh air. I long, I no longer wish to be in curfew, but rather to be free, giving back my stolen wings because I wish to soar high. Unpass the time, set me free. My aged mother is counting it. The final seasons of tomorrow to await. Set me free to harvest more of tomorrow's, to discover a new life, to explore another beginning. Please stop extracting the remaining of me. Set me free because to reclaim, because I wish to reclaim my ownership, to rejoin my own being. Set me free because I want to celebrate my actual existence, or at least grant me a one more chance to die in an open space in the embrace of the morning zipper, perhaps. Uh, the next poem I uh, please uh, uh, notify me because I'm just constantly going on with the poems and if there's any, if I'm just yeah, taking too much time, just let me know. I'm going to recite another poem called, it's called, uh, Believe Me, It Is Painful. And it describes uh, how difficult it is to talk about my PTSD and how difficult it is to talk about the past traumatic life that I have experienced and it's not easy to see you can just pretend that you that it does not hurt you yeah, it hurts very badly yet uh, sometimes I, I feel obliged to tell people when they ask about that it's called believe me it's pen it's painful each time i retell my story people don't realize the, the pain it causes me nor the amount of pain i have been through revisiting my sufferings may seem easy to you but believe me I have to gather myself up and draw all my strength together, borrowing courage from the very core of me each time and every time I add a, a single word. November 5, 2017. And uh, I would like to recite uh, a love poem. I think it is enough. Uh, reciting traumatizing poems, and I would like to, I wish to, uh, to describe uh, a beautiful, a very beautiful angelic uh, girl that once I met, and it is a real story, and I met, and I saw someone, and then I just, uh, yeah, I just, uh, when I reached home, I, I wrote something about what I have seen, I just tried to define the beauty and the feeling that I had at that time. It's called the beauty I met yesterday. I saw an unusual beauty, clothed in black and white. Her beguiling eyes splashed intense golden rays of light. Her countenance was so joyful and bright as if a graceful moon had risen in the night. I watched her glowing hair being tossed in the wind, reflected back at me like beams of black diamonds. Her wondrous eyes held visions of aurora borealis, sorry for the mispronunciation, borealis that were guiding me along the roadway to Angel's Island. She was simply fascinating, the way her lips moved to formulate, formulate her words, created beautiful music, as if straight from the strings of an old Egyptian old. Her voice had the finest rhythm, as of the early morning's fresh cooling breeze. When she was silent, I still imagined that I was listening to a lively melody but perhaps it was my beating heart, a poet's trumpet note. August 24, 2018. And... Uh, Great, maybe we should end there. 
Are there sure. any other poems you want to refer? Uh, uh, there is uh, two more, but yeah, it's okay. I have I have recited so many of them, and I think it th is yes. All right, great. Thank you so much, Abdul. Just so we have time for the conversation. Sure. Um, and I think that's a great poem to end with. Um, yeah, and I was very moved by, oh, did you want to make an announcement before we go into our Q&A section? Where is uh, that? Uh, mm -hmm. um, yes, so I want to also mention um, that we are, are welcoming donations as well for the reader tonight. I am putting the GoFundMe into the chat uh, as well as Jinjin's um, Venmo, but please, if you are Venmoing Jinmo, uh, are Venmoing Jinjin, sorry, um, please also label the donations um, in quotations for Abdul, so that she knows, you know, that that's that's the purpose and where to direct them. Um, so give me two moments, and I will drop this in the chat for you all to to see tonight. Okay, great. We'll just move on. Yes. Thank you so much. Yes. Mara. In the meantime, you can move we'll, on. Thank you. Here it <laughs> yeah, is. we'll talk more about the um, what the GoFundMe is for later in our uh, interview session right now. So um, I know, Abdul, that you would like to share with everyone a bit about your background and how you began writing. And I know your life is larger than the narrative can hold. Um, but will you tell us a bit about your journey to Indonesia and your life as a journalist before this? Sure. <clears throat> Uh, I became uh, a refugee at the age of eight, nine. I don't exactly remember because I don't have any birth certificates, so everything gone with the war uh, began in the country. And um, and then uh, I lost my sister there, and my uh, my brother, elder brother Abdullah, has been shot in his right foot in his middle toe. And then we fled to Pakistan, and uh, after that we fled to Iran, and then I and my father were kept in captivity for, for three months and I was uh, getting a little bit like uh, like Nam. And then uh, after the negotiation, they sent me and kept, keep, sent me to Tehran and kept, me, kept my father in captivity because my father was not able to pay the uh, smackers. And then I went uh, to Iran, I was caught and I was deported back to Afghanistan. And I, from there, I had to go to, back to Pakistan. You know, three times it, it repeated. And the, last, uh, the, the second time I was uh, caught in Kandifush, uh, close to Kandahar, and with my three tribesmen, we were. They made us uh, stand in line. They made us stood, uh, stand in line, and then they shot three tribesmen of mine, the Hazaras. And I fell unconscious, and I don't know what happened after that. But I, when I opened my eyes, I was in the back seat of a uh, bus, so I was rescued. And then uh, I went to Pakistan again, and my mother again sent me to Iran. And then I worked there as a child labor at the construction science uh, sites for some time. So then I returned to Pakistan, deported back to Pakistan. 2017, seven, I went to Afghanistan. I started working with a journalism, journalist. And I worked with the Daily uh, Outlook Afghanistan, Daily Afghanistan Express. And I worked with uh, also, I, I, I also remained as a humanitarian broker with ActionNet and also Norwegian Refugee Council and a few others. And uh, I was covering, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, controversial topics because I did not know, I did not have a lot of idea, knowledge about the political context in Afghanistan. And that put me into and the direct uh, target. And it went on my, the chief and editor has been uh, kidnapped and he was rescued and then he exiled. And all my, almost all my colleagues, they have been, uh, we have been under the constant threat and some of them have been rescued by uh, foreign uh, missions in the country to their respective countries. And then I fled to, uh, to, to Pakistan. I did not have the chance. And then another newspaper has been banned. The Daily Afghanistan Express has, uh, Express has been banned by the Sayyaf's Malaysia group because of an article we published was believed to be blasphemous. And then from Pakistan, I fled to Indonesia. And then uh, in 2014, I arrived in Indonesia. And then I was on asylum seeker. I, sought, uh, I got my refugee status with the UNHCR in 2016. And since then, I'm living in Indonesia as a refugee. And writing, I started writing in a very early age because my father was a very uh, literature uh, interested man. He was always reciting poetry for us, and I, I grew up listening to him. And then he was, taught, he, he was teaching me how to recite poems, poem Hafiz Shirazi, if you have heard, and Jalaluddin Balkhi Rumi, who was very famous by Rumi. 
Maulana Jalaluddin Balkiruni, we call him, and then so many other poets. And uh, I started writing when I returned from uh, from Iran, and I started my uh, personal education, and then I just started writing in a very early age of 13, 14, 15. And since then, I have been writing. When I uh, in Afghanistan, I wrote, and the first poem I wrote in Afghanistan when I wrote, and when I went back to Afghanistan, it was in Bami. And when I saw the children, it was very scary to me, and it was uh, at the same time wondrous to see children. Every child was holding a gun, you know, uh, made of wood, and playing war with others. You know, it was just it, it burst me, burst me into tears, and I was just so uh, emotionally. Uh, uh, sad, you know, seeing these kids, instead of going to school, they were falling guns. And I started uh, writing a poem about that, it's called Every Child. Uh, I know a country where every child knows the word, uh, the word gun before the word uh, pen, the word war before the word peace. So that was my first poem I, I wrote uh, in Bamiyan, Afghanistan. And then in Indonesia, I started, uh, I was writing, and then in Indonesia, uh, I just somehow managed to write, and I wrote almost 1,000 poems until 2018. And uh, hopefully, thankfully, the Red Ribbon was published in 2019, July 2019. And there are a few books, uh, poems ready to be edited and uh, published. And I am working right now on my autobiography and also my PTSD book. Uh, I hope I gave you the answer. Sorry for being a little bit, you know. Going long, long, long down, second, second, second. No, it's perfect. What has been some of the challenges for your publishing journey so far? Uh, challenges, PTSD, I was um, suffering from PTSD, financial difficulties, and then, uh, you know, so many kind of diseases, kidney infection, panic attacks, getting thin, and then, and not, you know, you know, very comfortable or at least an appropriate place to, to stay, unable to find an editor. And, uh, and then once I found an editor, it was, I am not able to, I am not allowed to publish it because I'm not allowed to find opportunities, education, traveling, anything. So I could not sign the contract. I needed a representative for that. It was difficult to, to find a representative. And then, uh, yeah, and then the book has been, uh, has been published, uh, the Red Ribbon, 200 po copies, uh, 2,000 copies with 200 poems. And uh, there was no book launch in here. And then, unfortunately, the wrong copy of the Red Ribbon has been published. So it is not the, the real version of that. And uh, it is the, uh, the, the script only. And then, uh, yeah, I could not do anything with the refugee, nothing. Only I had to keep my mouth shut. And, uh, and then uh, other challenges of being like, sometimes I feel like I'm no one, you know, I'm not even any, any importance as, as, uh, as author of the Red Ribbon. Though Red Ribbon is now the third best sellers in Indonesia. And uh, then uh, there was no kind of coordination about the book launch. And uh, somehow there was one book launch, the first book launch happened in Australia by Janet Galbraith, the Behos Britannia's editor and also John Guzzari, and then in here, my foster father, Dr. Ross, uh, he, with my representative, Sandia Institute, they organized the book launch in 2019, late 2019. Uh, these were the challenges, you know, a lot of things. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, I am just no one in between, just my name is there in the book, and that's all. Mm. A lot of these poems are intimate poems are intimately addressed to a you, to a reader. So who do you have in mind as you're writing these poems? Who is your audience? Who do you imagine listening on the other side of the page? Oh, my sister, parents, siblings, my own miserable life, and uh, the refugees in Indonesia and across the world. And uh, the audience is the world, and particularly those who believe refugees are as humans as others those who see refugees as loving humans, as others, those who feel humans li human lives matter, who fight for human rights and human dignity, those who believe in, uh, and in universal peace, who are willing to be a part of human rights, who are willing to open their hearts and minds to help refugees as torn, as war-torn people in desperate need of help. Refugees are deeply wounded. We need love. 
an acceptance that is every individual reads my poem and that addresses the person yeah yeah i'm i'm super moved by your poem believe me it's painful which you read earlier it begins with each time i retell my story people don't realize the pain it causes me so nor the amount of pain i've been through um and i'm moved by this reminder of the permanence and ongoingness of your trauma and pain and the strength it takes to narrativize that pain and experience and also implicating us the reader in that pain so while writing is important to you it is also a painful process and often it's like you're being asked to tell your story over and over again um, in in different ways like to prove your your status as a refugee to prove your right of living your right of compassion all these things so can you tell us more about the, your writing process and the choices in putting these experiences into poems and narratives? Uh, well, I, I personally believe that uh, uh, writing is the best way to advocate, uh, advocate or, 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 or scream out what they fail to see, feel, or here it gives me it is it is a very I feel very strong and like it gives me the wings to fly and you know be with everyone you know and the adequate amounts of voice to be heard it has uh, I think poetry has the power to as awareness of the destruction devastation any form of uh, writing faced by those of at least fortunate at least fortunate ones and uh, writing is the most appealing song to me, to my heart. Only, only with 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 writing and poetry, I can keep myself calm. It is it is the most beautiful morning, you know. I can say zipper that runs through my every pen. It is my passion and the collective meaning of life to me. Uh, but it is at the same time, it's not easy to write. Uh, uh, it is it is extremely difficult. Every memory I recall awakes traumas. These traumas, you know, like they are, they are so painful, and you know, with panic attacks are as painful as I die in a thousand painful ways. And uh, it feels when I talk about those traumatic things, I feel like I melt down. You know, I turn to, I go numb sometimes. I also, you know, have kind of you know half panic attacks. You know, without people realizing that, uh, and. Uh, the process before I was sitting at home writing those poems, but now I don't have that stamina anymore. And I recently choose to sit in a crowded, in crowded places to be able to write because the sound of people helps me feel safe, secure, and accompanied. Um, but I still feel half panic attack, panic you know, attacks when I write about the most uh, uh, difficult events that I have experienced. And also, I, I, I use prayers and being a little bit carefree about what happened to me and what may happen. That is, uh, that is the process and that is how I deal with the uh, uh, traumatic poems. Yeah, um, now I'd like to open up this, the chat to any questions anyone might have, or you can feel free to, you can unmute yourselves if you want to ask any questions to Abdul directly. Um, as we're getting to that, I'd just like to talk a little bit about ways we can further support Abdul's cause in the book. Um, Abdul, would you like to talk a little bit about um, ways we can support you further? Uh, uh, yes, it can be it can be through GoFund, and the link is uh, being posted there, and also uh, it will be spent for my medication and also. Uh, I'm working on my current projects. I need, you know, a laptop to, you know, keep my files safe at the same time to be able to complete these projects. And uh, it is also about sustaining myself during this tough time and not allowed to find the opportunities in Indonesia. It's not only all refugees are going through this situation. 
Uh, so this is how this uh, man is going to be spent. And so also, I, I also uh, uh, want if there is any opportunity to republish the web problem, if, if there is anyone, anyone of the audience uh, is having a kind of a contact or know some publisher uh, in any part of the world willing to publish, co-publish the web problem, I will really appreciate that. And I also appreciate if anyone comes forward and uh, be a part of refugees wise, be a part of Red Ribbon's wise, so advocate for the Red Ribbon and also uh, being, you know, providing some events or informing or, you know, uh, linking me with some academic events where I can just uh, uh, recite some of the poems from the Red Ribbon to advocate for refugees, to advocate that refugees are not bad people, we are not we're not going to steal anyone's rights, uh, jobs, or anything. And then uh, it could be also to, you know, the other most uh, uh, important thing would be, you know, a sponsorship, resettlement, sponsorship, with private sponsorship. If there's any opportunity, if anyone is willing to uh, go for the resettlement, uh, private sponsorship is also another option. I will really, very deeply cherish and I shall hold that in high. That is how I I would like to to plead at the end. Thank you so much, Abdul. So the GoFundMe link is in the chat, and Venmo is also an option. Um, if you know me personally, you can just Venmo me directly, and I will screenshot it and send it all to Abdul. Um, just Venmo because there's less transaction costs than GoFundMe, but GoFundMe is a page that can be shared um, and with more um, like accountability publicly. Um, yeah, and we have a question from the audience from dear Emma. So she asked, do you always write in English? Uh, hi, Emma. Yes, I do. I always write in English and I feel very much connected to English because I have been studying these and I've been working using my English language. And due to lack of time being, you know, in my own country, I even, you know, I'm just I feel very weak at my own in my own language because I have not been able to practice my language a lot, uh, especially in the in academic way. Yeah, and related to that, you always put the date and time and place of when you finish the poems at the bottom of your poem, and there, I mean, you're so um, you. you you, I feel like you're able to write a poem every day or when I look at these dates. So is that when you finish a poem or you finish writing a, like when you edit a poem or what, uh, what is that for you? There's a very mysterious reason behind that. One, I do that because I am not uh, permanently in one place. So like a nomad, I have to move from place to place. One, two, I, I, I did that because at that time I was thinking that uh, that will, those days were the end of my time and I felt like, you know, I may not have a lot of time to live, to be able to cope with all the things in my head and in my body. And there are, these are the two reasons that I put down, you know, that, that did always. All right, thank you so much, Abdul. I know we're around out of time. So if anyone ha has any other questions or Feel free to jump in, uh, Marissa or Rachel. Um, if there are, are no more questions, and I'll just kind of sign us off then. Thank you so, so much, Abdul, for, for being here and for sharing your story and for sharing your beautiful poetry with us and, and everything that, that went into the crafting and, and the shaping of them. Um, it's a, a real gift to have you here tonight. So thank you for for your honesty, for your openness, for your vulnerability. Thank you, Jin Jin, for hosting and for your really insightful questions. Um, I'm just really grateful to have been here and, and to have witnessed this. So um, thank I, you. Um, a last kind of reminder um, that the GoFundMe and the Venmo are, are in the chat. So so please do, if, if you feel so moved, um, you know, um, show some generosity there. And, and other than that, just thank you all again. Thank you also for those of you who have joined us tonight. Um, for, for being there and for listening and have a wonderful rest of your Sunday evening and a good week on the way out. Abdul, did you want to say something just now? Uh, yeah, I really appreciate uh, 
uh, for giving me the chance to be here. And I feel really, really, very privileged. And I also would like to mention at the end that Red Ribbon is uh, not, was never, you know, well, I was never able to publish the Red Ribbon uh, without people being around to me, and without the people's support. My, I, I would like to express my, my, my very special feeling of gratitude to my foster father, Dr. Ross, uh, the spouse of New Zealand's ambassador to ASEAN, uh, Her Excellency uh, Ambassador Pan, uh, who is like a mother to me, and also my representative, Sandy Ida Secure, who has been helping me uh, in the process, and also all other people, my Indonesian friend, family friends who have been helping me, supporting me throughout the process. And I really, very humbly appreciate uh, the Indonesians who have given me the opportunity to stay here, allowing me to stay uh, in Indonesia when I do not have anywhere else to go. And I really thank everyone being a part of the Red Ribbon, helping me throughout the process. And Dr. Ross has been uh, helping so much and also uh, some other friends, Indonesian family friends. I really appreciate all those who have given me the opportunity to be among them, to, for them being uh, accepting me to be among them without uh, excluding my, my, my uh, current situation or refugee status or anything. They just love me because of who I am and because of my own human being status. I really appreciate them. Thank you very much for having me here today. Thank you, Abdul. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Take Thank care. you. Have a good time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.